Matty, a writer for Eurogamer, uh, and I can feel Ripley's of excitement about this session. No? I was going to do a, ba a bad pun, what, Weaver, you like it or not? No? Okay, I'll stop. Um, you're all here to see Alien Isolation, so I'll hand it over to Al, John, and Byron. Hello everyone, um, welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, as you might be able to tell, I'm actually losing my voice. Um, I hope it, hope it stays long enough for me to get through this part. Um, you know, for us, Alien Isolation really is the alien game that we've always wanted to play. Um, a game that goes back to the roots of the series, back to that Ridley Scott haunted house in space. <clears throat> you know, we really wanted to make a game where just one alien could be a really meaningful and really terrifying interaction for the player. You know, um, for us, the Alien very much is the star of the show. You know, it's very dynamic and reactive. It's, uh, it's very unpredictable and, and utterly, t uh, you know, very frightening. It's at the core of the game, and it's the, ge it's, it's the core that we built the rest of the game around. Yet, for the Alien to really, truly work, we had to create a very believable world. We wanted to make a game that really immersed the player, that really, really sucked them into the atmosphere. Um, you know, we wanted to create an Alien game like no other. So today, we're going to take you behind the scenes. We're going to show you some of the ways in which the incredibly talented team at Creative Assembly put this world together. Um, and we're going to show you a little bit of an insight into how we went uh, through creating the original uh, uh, content with the uh, original crew and cast uh, for the bonus content. So please welcome uh, sound designer Byron Bullock and lead audio that's lead audio. <laughs> lead UI designer, uh, John McKellen. Hello. So, um, yeah, so some people may have seen a little bit of this that we talked about at Res before. Um, but I just kind of want to recap about um, how we went about kind of creating uh, the new spaces that you see in Sebastopol. Um, out of a film that was kind of set in a very small space. You know, the Nostromo in the original film was pretty small. We didn't see much of it. Um, so this was a, a real challenge for us to extrapolate from what we saw and, and create whole new spaces. So um, what we really did was look at um, deconstructing the film to all its component parts. You know, we, we really tore apart every scene, um, every bit of set design to try and work out how this was built. And what we would do is we'd create archetypes. And an archetype... Um, would be a style guide of props, uh, materials, fixtures, fittings, you know, everything that we could work out. How did they light those spaces? How, what what uh, materials did they use to build the sets and how would they react to the light? Everything we could. Um, this would be used to create a visual language which we could then move on from and, and create whole new assets and whole new spaces for the Sevastopol that looked and felt like they could have been just beyond a closed door on the Nostromo. You know, they'd feel uh, authentic, but still be original, still be new for the player. Luckily, we were given a massive archive, um, three terabytes worth of stuff from Fox, um, of imagery and, and uh, uh, you know, behind the scenes stuff that was complete gold dust that really helped us um, understand how things were done back then. The first thing we'd do would, uh, would be to take the concepts that were done by the likes of Ron Cobb, um, this is some of his work, um, that would really, they were really done in a very specific style, a very architectural style, um, kind of line art, rather than kind of big painted uh, dioramas and such like. And we would produce our concept art in the same way. So we'd try and think the way they would think um, and use the same tools and the same um, methods. Um, so this is a, an idea of a habitation archetype, the kind of living spaces and, and how we would take what was in the film and stretch it out. So, um, and here you've got some of, on the left hand side, some uh, shit, you know, how we can create new patterns, new wall paddings, um, what, what it would look like damaged, that kind of thing, really helped us explore that. But aside from the, the kind of uh, extrapolation, we had to come up with something uh, really accurate as well for the bonus content. Um, so we had to recreate the Nostromo in as close to detail as we could. Um, Fox gave us blueprints, they gave us um, continuity Polaroids, they gave us shots that have never been seen that really allowed us to get a, a hang of how things were built and exactly what size and shape things were. 
Uh, so we've got uh, the, these kind of shots, you know, stuff that you just didn't get to see in the film. Even seeing the set fully lit uh, in a completely different way from what was in the film allowed us to get a handle on uh, what was being used. Now, all of that gave us the, the structure and gave us the, uh, the shape of things, but obviously lighting and VFX, you know, things like smoke and mist, uh, as well as alarm lights and stuff, really it was, you know, absolutely essential to get to what we actually saw in the film. Um, it's one thing to be prop accurate and understand how the props are made, but to be screen accurate and make sure all these things come together in the same way was vitally important. So this is um, a little clip we're going to show you now of um, part of the Nostromo. And if you can cast your mind back to the film and how the kind of final sequences in that film looked, um, I think you'll see it's, it's pretty similar. So that's a little bit of uh, gameplay from the uh, pre-order content. Um, obviously, in the film, Ellen Ripley didn't die from a, an alien event, but um, we get to play around with some what-ifs there. Um, along with the space, we had to create, uh, recreate the Nostromo crew. You know, this is the first time the crew had kind of gotten back together for 35 years, um, and we had to kind of recreate their likenesses. Um, Normally, we would look at things like um, still images and press images, anything that gives us a real high-resolution look at um, these, these people's uh, faces from different angles. Um, so we had to recreate the cast. Now, it's 35 years ago. It's not now. So you know, things like scanning is out of the question at this point. Um, we're trying to recreate a likeness from a long time ago. Uh, we would use film stills and screenshots and try and get the best reference possible. But what we're really looking for is the kind of front side elevations, you know, these kind of uh, side-on shots that really give us an you know, unfiltered look at what these guys look like. And luckily, the Fox archive had a few gems in there that made it really, you know, really easy for us to do. Um, continuity Polaroids existed. Um, now, cont Continuity Polaroids, they kind of take at the end of each day to make sure that, you know, the costume is correct and hair is in the right place so that there's continuity between each day of filming. Um, and they'd taken all these shots of the main cast so we had the perfect reference material that we couldn't have, uh, we just did not expect to have this kind of stuff. Um, so this was um, what we used to generate the final assets. We used these as reference and also the kind of more press shots, you know, stuff that wasn't uh, stills from the film but was on set. And that allowed us to create the likenesses of uh, Ripley and Co. Now, Moving on from the Nostromo, um, this kind of uh, building a bigger world, big in, building the Sevastopol. Again, the Nostromo is a pretty, this is roughly square footage what we kind of see in the film. And there's not much more to the Nostromo layout than this. Um, but we had much more to create um, for the Sevastopol. And this is just some of it. Uh, there's a lot more to come from that. Um, so we had a big challenge there because we couldn't, you know, even just looking at that, it's quite interesting that you can you can see that you can't just stick to the same shapes, you can't stick to the exact same layout of the Nostromo and do that for um, a full game campaign. We had to vary those spaces and create much larger rooms to explore, um, you know, layered sections that you wouldn't normally see. Um, so being a space station rather than a ship, there needed to be larger sections, you know, it couldn't all be corridors. It had to look beyond what we see in the Nostromo. Um, now we do have those claustrophobic areas, those vents and those, those areas that really feel you know, unpleasant to be in. Um, but the larger places would provide relief from that claustrophobia. It would add its own gameplay element, which would be that you know, in a corridor, you've got kind of danger from in front and behind. But in a wide open space, you can breathe a bit more, but you're now open from any angle for attack. So it's a kind of trade off in comfort there. Um, now, these larger spaces are still informed by the archetypes, are still you know, inspired by the original architecture, but they are completely unique. Um, a couple of concept examples. This is um, some observation sections with multi-layers, which we've not seen before. Um, some you know, lobby areas that, that lead on to much more complex spaces. They have these kind of central hubs. 
and also things like transit stations and uh, spaceports, you know, these large, really large areas that funnel a lot of people through um, that are completely new. Now, with these large spaces, we've got to try and bring them to life and inject some detail in there. Um, the original film was incredibly detailed. You know, even now, if you look at the Blu-rays and, and really you know, freeze-frame that movie, the, the set design is incredible. It's like Roger Christian and those guys done an amazing job at making this thing feel real, and it's why it stands up today. Um, so to make, it, to make the Sevastopol believable in the same way, we had to keep that level of detail going through all of our spaces throughout the station. You know, it had to con consistently be detailed. Um, now, this detail adds backstory, adds atmosphere, and it can inform the gameplay. Things like player navigation and whether they get lost or not, we can use that detail to help the player understand where to go or inform them of dangers that are up ahead. And a couple of small clips of stuff here. We've got things like personal lockers. I've got the multi-language signing that you see in the Nostromo. Um, you know, even just little tiny sets of buttons that were in the film have been kind of meticulously recreated. Um, and just a, a level of detail and a kind of monitor bank there where there's just so much stuff you take it for granted as being real. You don't question it so much. And that really lets the player get invested in the story, invested in the world without having to think too much about, you know, there's nothing to throw them off. There's nothing um, broken about the image that they're seeing. So some of these sets are very detailed, very believable spaces. Um, and it's not just about architecture and structure. We've got personal effects, you know, photographs and uh, you know, calendars and, and uh, memorabilia that people have that really give it a sense it's been lived in by people and not just something that's been created from scratch and has never been lived in. So this is just one part of it. This is uh, the, the visual side of things. I'll hand you over to Byron just now to talk about the sound, and uh, then we'll show you how this all comes together. So thank you. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we made the sound of Alien Isolation. And I kind of wanted to start by um, quoting a certain George Lucas who famously said that sound is 50% of the movie going experience. And I think a similar thing can be said about the game experience, except it's probably split three ways. That's visually, audibly, and physically. Physically being the kind of gameplay mechanics. Um, so we can say that sound is a third of the game-going experience, which isn't quite as catchy as what George said. But um, nevertheless, the more important thing, I think, is that all three of these kind of systems have to, disciplines, should I say, have to come together at the right time to make a really immersive experience. So why is sound such an important part of the game-going experience? Well, first of all, sound is a really emotional medium. It kind of works on a subconscious level. So it can evoke all kinds of feelings like anxiety, fear, um, stress, tension, release. And that's a really important part of creating a horror experience because we want to push the player kind of emotionally in certain ways. We want to make them feel scared and we want to make them feel anxious. That's a really important part. Um, also, sound is quite an um, immersive medium. It helps to ground objects and add a sense of realism. And also, sound isn't bound by the confines of a picture frame or the edges of a TV or the edges of a, a film, um, a theatre, for example. It's a lot more than that. It can tell us what's happening in the other room or behind the other side of a wall or down the other end of a corridor. It's not confined by what's happening here and now. It tells us a lot more. And that's quite an important part of creating a horror experience because we want to both lead and mislead the player. We want to create that fear of the unknown. So as soon as you start to hear something but you don't see it, straight away it puts you on edge. And obviously we want to basically drive an emotional reaction from the player. So, how do we do this? How do we use these principles in Alien Isolation? Well, first of all, it's important to understand that although the story part of Alien Isolation is quite a linear um, experience, the kind of core values of it are quite non-linear. So that whole gameplay moment of you and the alien is very non-linear. So we have this unpredictable, clever, adaptive alien that uses its senses to hunt you down so it can hear you, it can um, see you in plain sight, and it can see the, kind of, uh, the light coming from your torch. So it uses these senses to hunt you down, and that's quite a problem for the sound team because we need to be able to preempt what's happening. We want to be able to build tension and suspense. Um, so it became an exercise in creating systems that could do that, systems that could 
react to what the alien's doing and react to what the player is doing and basically tell us what's happening. So, moving on to the score. Um, the most recognized, one of the most recognizable parts of the film, audibly, is definitely the score. Jerry Goldsmith's original um, 1979 score is very unique to the film and we knew when we were making an alien experience that we were going to have to license or try and license that score and I'm proud to say that we did. We managed to license the themes, which was a great moment. It was high fives all round in the sound team. Um, it was one of the big pieces of the puzzle, but as soon as we started to drill down into that score, we realised there was only a few moments of real thematic material and we needed something that was 120 minute plus, something that was suitable for the game. So the composers had to go about drilling down into finite detail what really made that score feel like an alien score so that they could expand upon those themes and those motifs and make more for us. And I'm going to play a small video of uh, one of the first recording sessions we did down at Air Studios. One of the most amazing parts of this actually is some of the... Um, Musicians in the orchestra actually played in the original um, orchestra back in 1979, so they're actually there 35 years ago, and they're now recreating that for us, which is quite amazing. So that's um, a small part of one of our first sound recordings that we did. So we had this amazing um, music, thanks to Jerry Goldsmith and our composers, but we needed a sound engine that could play that music back um, at runtime. So we couldn't have a static score. That score needed to be able to change. It needed to be able to adapt and almost remix and react to what was happening. Um, it needed to be able to change uh, depending on what the player was doing, but also on what the alien was doing. We needed to be able to drive both suspense and tension. Um, and I'm going to show a small game clip now which shows that kind of system running.
So I think that's a good example of um, the system at work, what's something that we call the context-driven sound engine. And two key factors kind of um, drive that system. The first one is stealth, which is uh, one value which tells us at any given moment how stealthy the player is being. And a few um, key factors drive that, things like the amount of noise the player makes, the distance they are to the enemy, and also the enemy's awareness. So something like the alien has lots of different awareness states, and all of those feed in to give us a stealth amount. Um, secondly, threat, which is distance to the enemy and the enemy's awareness. But you might look at those and think, well, they're kind of the same thing, but they act very differently. Um, a good example might be as soon as the alien sees you, um, you're probably about to die unless you've got the flamethrower active. But at that point, your threat is maxed out and your stealth is zero because you're being the most unstealthy person on Sevastopol. Um, so those... Two key factors change both the music, almost remixing it live at runtime, but also it changes the mix of the game. So a good example of that might be the player hiding under a table in AI as the alien stalks by. The game will know that and it will decide to start changing the mix. The idea is we want to focus in on what's important, which is the relationship between you and the alien. So it will start to drop away the atmosphere and the unimportant sounds, the kind of noise that you want to filter away, and it wants to focus what's important, and that is you and the aliens. It will start to raise up the, the sounds of the alien and the sounds of your breathing and your, your kind of other sounds to try and help kind of bring more tension and suspense. Um, and of course, this happens on a subconscious level. We don't want the player to notice it, because that would be bad, and we just want them to feel the effects. So, um, a, little, a little bit about the world. I could talk for ages about how we made the sound of the world, but I don't really have enough time, so I'm just going to talk about one key thing, which is um, authenticity, which John's talked about quite a lot. And that extended to the sound team, definitely. Um, we want to be as authentic as possible. Um, but obviously the film happened, it was made 35 years ago, 1979. Finding original material was very hard. This was a time of analog tape, big reel-to-reels. There was no digital archiving or digital recording back then. Um, so getting original material was very hard, but our creative director, Al, he got onto Fox a lot, and eventually they sent us, or what they did do, sorry, is they sent someone down to their archives, um, which is, oh, let's go back which is actually um, underneath the Fox lot. So it's not like a small back room. It's a massive, almost warehouse-sized place underneath their lot in LA. And um, they brought us back some reels, some analog reels, and they said, do you want these? It's got like alien M&E written on it. And we were like, yeah, we just want anything. Just send it over. So they sent it over digitally to us. And when I opened it up in Horsham in the studio, what we had was the original sound effects that had been recorded by the British sound engineers over at Shepparton 35 years ago. Um, so this wasn't the whole film, this was just the small independent sound effects that were supposed to support the music. And this was like a gold mine for us. It mean, meant we could make more of this original content. And I've got a, a recording of one of uh, the sounds that we found. See if you can recognize it. There's a cue, there's a cue at the end. Clue at the end. Effects one. Effects one. Effects five. Um, along with the British sound engineers, you also heard what we dubbed the space whale, which um, we've used that like loads in the, in, in the game, everywhere. But what we've been able to do is take the original recordings and we've been able to make more, which is amazing. And what I really like is the fact that these sounds have been gathering dust for 35 years. Um, nobody's seen them and we're getting to put them in front of a new audience. And there's lots of these kind of sounds across the game. I don't want to spoil it, but there's lots of this stuff, and it really helps to add an authentic feel. Um, and that's, that's me.
bring Al back on. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, so actually, we just wanted to kind of pull, oh my goodness, uh, pull this all together uh, and show you a slice of the game, uh, which we haven't really showed much of, um, and that's the start of the game. Uh, no spoilers, don't worry. Um, but uh, this gives a good uh, little glimpse of, of all of that incredible work coming together uh, right now. I don't know if we have time for questions. We do. We have. We have about five minutes for questions. Um, microphones will be brought to uh, just in the aisles here. If you have a question, uh, just walk up to the microphone um, and queue up there. Lean in and be confident and proud. Uh, and yeah, ask away. Uh, yeah. Get up there now and, and ask. Hi there. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how did you balance uh, between keeping the game suspenseful and tense all the time, but not exhausting the player? Yeah, because. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, we, you know, this game has to be about tension and release. It can't be kind of unrelenting. I don't think that'd be much fun, um, you know. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, we, we, I think we try and take a step back as much as possible. We create the structure. You know, we have this cool story that's going to pull you through, and we kind of put the main beats down um, uh, and the kind of key events. But what happens in between is kind of down to the systems and down to you, down to your choices. And so, um, you know, if you want to hide in a locker for five minutes and have a bit of downtime, you can have a go at that. Um, uh, so you can help drive that that kind of that that kind of uh, roller coaster. Um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we never want the player to feel safe, 100% safe. Uh, but there are moments where we want the player to be able to uh, breathe a sigh of relief, you know, kind of collect their thoughts before embarking once again into the unknown. Yeah. Just 
to uh, repeat the uh, question. He's asking about, for the Twitch people who won't be able to hear, he's asking about VR and how people get too scared, maybe, to play the game. Yeah, um, that's not our problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's definitely... We get too uh, scared. Yeah. No, you know, so, hey, you know, we, at E3 we showcased our alien isolation kind of Oculus Rift prototype. Uh, it really was that. It was a prototype. It was us exploring, taking our, you know, kind of our, our first steps into VR. It seemed massively exciting. Um, you know, our mechanics and that technology together seemed like a really great fit. Uh, it is a prototype. You know, we need to really uh, go back to the studio and figure out what, you know, where we go next with this. Um, you know, we're, we're on the start of our journey, and we, you know, like I said, we need to figure out. Uh, where we go. I mean, it was great. I mean, the re response has been absolutely tremendous. You know, seeing people kind of rip the, the DK2, very expensive DK2 kit off their heads um, in panic, you know, was, was very rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, how similar were you aiming the game experience to be to the movie experience? Yeah, I think, oh, um, very similar. You know, I think we were trying to capture the essence of that first film. I think games in the past had really focused on the James Cameron experience, you know, pulse rifles and marines and, and lots and lots of aliens, and, and that's cool, you know, we're fans of that, but it felt like when we started, no one had ever created the alien experience that we wanted to play, like I said. Um, you know, something that really was about survival and not about killing, that really was about the player moment to moment trying to make the best choices as to survive. You know, just like the crew and the Nostromo, uh, you know, they're really underpowered and underprepared. You know, they're not safe, you know. And I think it was just started from the kind of what if, you know, what would it actually be like to try and survive against that original alien? And, and so, you know, the guys have done an amazing job of recreating that, you know, that sense of immersion and, and something that's really absorbing, um, as, as I think we've just seen. Um, and, and, and actually, you know, it was interesting, it was testament to that work that actually I think helped us um, secure the, the original cast involvement, you know, because I think they could see the care and attention that we had put into creating the world that they had created originally back in the 70s. So, yeah, I mean, it was really important to us. Awesome. Cheers. How important is the pre-order content? And will I be able to get it after launch at any point if I don't pre-order? Um, so I think we came out and said that the pre-order bonus content will be available uh, at some point. I don't think we've actually put a date to it yet, but it will be available. Um, and as to the how important, uh, it's very important to us. Uh, it's, um, it's great. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we, we, I think we've referred to it as bonus content. You know, the main game is very much its own story. Uh, and, and that's, I guess, the, uh, the main thing for us. But uh, we had this amazing opportunity to work with the original cast to reunite them for the first time, to, to have them kind of recreate um, that, that sort of the moments from that first film. Um, it is bonus content, it's, it's, it's fantastic, and, and, and the, you know, it, it, yeah, like I said, it will be available at some point. Um, so, for me, the last Aliens game, Colonial Marines, was a total letdown. I just wondered what kind of pressure you felt. <laughs> Let's face it, guys, come on, you know, wasn't it? Um, what kind of pressure did you feel to deliver uh, for the fans that have really wanted this quality Aliens game for quite some time? Um, well, I think we put an enormous amount of pressure on ourselves. Um, we don't need anybody else's pressure. Um, you know, we, because this game came from us. This was the game that we wanted to make. Um, it, you know, and, and, and I guess, you know, we have very high, high standards. We, we kind of set ourselves very um, demanding goals. And, you know, I think that was, that was the most important thing for us. You know, we, we started this game four years ago, or just over four years ago now. Um, you know, way before Colonial Marines came out. And so we, we, you know, we knew what we were trying to create and the goals that we were trying to achieve and, and have stayed really super focused on that the entire time. You know, how, however, you know, we were not completely you know, isolated. You know, we did hear the commentary around Colonial Marines and, and uh, when it came out, but you know, at the same time it seemed quite reassuring. There seemed to be a lot of people saying, can we have a scary aliens game you know, where one alien is actually super terrifying? And, and I think that was the reassuring thing for us is that was the game we were making. So it felt like there was an audience out there uh, who, like us, really wanted the, the experience that we were putting together. So, uh, you know, we couldn't tell anyone, but uh, that, was, that was good to know. I can't wait anyway. So. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for one more quick one. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I was really surprised to see how much of the original um, elements from the movie um, you actually managed to dig up, like a whole sound library of sounds and these kind of things. 
So I was kind of wondering um, when I saw the kind of headshots of the people turning around that, um, you know, that's like a 3D artist's dream because they, you know, they can model yeah. around it. I wondered at what point did you manage to unearth all these kind of elements? Had you already started the game and then suddenly came across these kind of things? Or did you, you know, did you know from the start that you had all these elements? Because, you know, I, it must have been a wonderful surprise for you guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. Well, I mean, we were given everything as a, as a, a you know, a big a dump of information where we had, what was it, three terabytes worth of yeah. stuff, which is, takes a bit of time to go through. Um, and you, you start going through that and looking for the stuff that's relevant at each time as you approach different things. And so we, we did learn so much from that very early on. And it, it was always a source to go back to, like even up until the very last stages of development, we're still dipping into that reference and looking for things and noticing new things, you know. But, um, yeah. Sorry. But I was just thinking to, to your point about, um, you know, the, I think, you know, you, sit, you, go, you go through all this stuff and you go, right, this is good, this is, you know, this is amazing, this is relevant, maybe not so relevant right now. Um, but you have all these kind of crazy ideas about getting the original cast involved and, and it's when it starts to become more of a reality that you kind of think, hang on, don't we have the original mm -hmm. cast members' headshots somewhere? And, it, and yeah, exactly, you know, it's a, it, it comes back and, and, and it was absolutely perfect. I mean, we couldn't have had a more perfect reference. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thanks of all, uh, most of all, to Al, John, and Byron. <laughs> Remember, uh, Alien is playable on the show floor, so go and get scared uh, for yourself and, and tell your friends about it. The next session we have is Never Alone, a fascinating game uh, built for, by Inuits, I think, for the, uh, for the Inuits.